Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Centre for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of CG's signature lecture series. Thanks also to those joining us from around the world through our live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences here at CG at the microphones and also online through the uh, chat function on your screen. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our guest tonight. Uh, we could ask for no better authority to speak on the state of the Canadian Armed Forces and its priorities than the Chief of Staff. General Tom Lawson was appointed to this position in October 2012, the culmination of a 30-year career in the forces. He graduated from Royal Military College in 1979 as an electrical engineer, trained as a fighter pilot, served in two operational tours in Europe, led his own squadron of CF-18s, obtained other graduate degrees on the way. Later positions included wing commander of Canada's largest military base, CFB Trenton, commandant of his alma mater, RMC, and assistant chief of the air staff, and later deputy commander of NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, which as you know, tracks Santa's movements every Christmas Eve. <laughs> He's also a fine friend, a family man, a husband and father. I can say this because I'm pleased to have known him for more than 40 years. Uh, you might think that that would give me some material to say something mischievous about his early years. Unfortunately, he was a model teenager, uh, mature beyond his age, did his homework, excelled, excelled uh, scholastically, played high school football, played in the orchestra, ran for student council, went to church and shoveled the snow for old Mrs. Keedwell next door. <laughs> I might have that last bit wrong, but you get the picture. These early indications of good character and citizenship help explain how he got to where he is today. The Chief of De Defence Staff, please welcome General Tom Lawson. Thanks, Fred, for that very kind introduction. Uh, Delighted to be on stage with you for the first time, I think, in 40 years since a school show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm truly honoured to be uh, here with you tonight. I thank you for your interest. Uh, also thankful that the Olympics are half a world away because I know that if uh, they were over in our time zone, we would have a crowd of probably about five in here right now. Uh, but. Uh, isn't it inspiring what we see in the Olympics? It's just such a, a fantastic thing. Sisters on the podium, uh, we see finalists giving up their slots so that others with a better chance can come through uh, for the nation. It just brings out the best in us and uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing. It's a real honour to be here in the great city of Waterloo this evening to, to talk about the state of the Canadian Armed Forces, your Canadian Armed Forces. And it makes a lot of sense to have this discussion right here at the Centre for International Governance Innovation. I'm a true believer that nowadays, more than ever, innovation is necessary. And I, I think we can agree that it's an essential part of any organization's mission to ensure that it's ready to face tomorrow's challenges and innovation allows us a higher probability to be ready for whatever those challenges are going to be in our fast-changing environment. This is true for the private sector, it's true for the government, and it's just as true for the Canadian Armed Forces. The work of this centre, the work of CG, the work of the academic community is therefore extremely important to all of us. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to give you my point of view on where the Canadian Armed Forces is at this point uh, and where we want to be in the future. Let's talk money and resourcing up front and, and put that to bed at least until the questions come. Let's face it, the current Fiscal context is challenging for each of us here tonight, likely, and it's difficult for many Canadians. And the Canadian Armed Forces are no exception. We have to do our job with fewer resources, and we have to do this while meeting Canadian expectations. Because Canadians, each of you, are entitled to the best military that your money can buy. And you're right in expecting the readiness and professionalism 
and expecting expertise and transparency in your Canadian Armed Forces. When Canadians across the country are tightening their belts, we owe them the best defence value for their dollars. Now, at the same time, our tasks aren't getting any easier, and as your Chief of Defence Staff, I will never whine about that. But the Canadian Armed Forces operate in a really complex, unpredictable and often vi uh, volatile environment at home and abroad. For more than a decade, I think as you well know, we've sustained operations in Afghanistan, reaching a peak of about 3,000 soldiers there at any given time. At the same time, we contributed in Libya, we've helped out those affected by natural disasters around the world and here at home all in the, si uh, the same time period. We got pretty busy uh, over the last few years and today while our operational tempo has slowed somewhat to a more normal rate, Canadian Armed Forces are still involved in 17 named operations around the world. Missions where our partners rely on Canadian military capabilities and expertise to support peace and security in different regions of the world, from Kosovo to South Sudan to Haiti, the Sinai, the West Bank, the Caribbean. But make no mistake, our priority remains the security of Canadians here at home. Canadians count, us, count on us to be ready to respond to emergencies and to support search and rescue efforts at a moment's notice. 65 is the new 45, and seniors who at one time might have focused on their lawns and their grandchildren are now venturing into the great outdoors and then sliding off of mountains or inverting their sailboats in high winds and deep waters. I see a bunch of you adventurers out there right now. You know who you are? That's okay. We'll be there uh, when you need us, as long as you have your emergency beacon on. About $350. <laughs> And think to last summer when southern Alberta was hit by heavy floods. The support from the Canadian Armed Forces was instrumental in saving the lives of Canadians in danger. On one of the first nights, one of the scenes over Calgary, uh, footage from that scene rivals anything you would see in Afghanistan. We had a Canadian Forces C-130 Hercules rotating about 5,000 feet above a certain portion of the neighbourhood that was being hit by rising waters 10, 15, 20 feet, dropping paraflares into the night sky to light that up, while two or three three cormorants pick people up with their pets, it's a full service we provide, off of their roofs. But natural disasters are not the only situation where our military are called upon to help our fellow Canadians. The Canadian Armed Forces and the Canadian Coast Guard coordinate responses to more than 9,000 search and rescue incidents annually. And every year on average, our men and women in uniform deploy uh, as a search and rescue team to about a thousand of these incidents. Incidents where they often operate in some really difficult terrain and horrible weather. They do this to affect the, the rescues of fishermen, of hunters, and those adventures that we've just spoken about. In short, Canadians rely on the Canadian Armed Forces to keep them safe and our international partners count on Canada to do its part overseas and those in need around the globe often require our military support as well. So we have to continue to deliver excellence in our operations in an increasingly complex environment and with more constrained resources. But when I think about this challenging context, I'm reminded it's really no different than any other challenging situation we all face at one point in our lives. On the academic front, on the business front, or on the personal front. We, the defense team, just simply have to take on this challenge. And we've decided, as do many organizations faced with tough choices, to see it as an opportunity for the Canadian Armed Forces to grow even stronger. An opportunity for extra doses of innovation. It's a chance for us to adapt, to reallocate, to transform, to focus and to allow the Canadian Armed Forces to become even more efficient while delivering success in every operation along the way. 
More than ever then, we have to prioritize to ensure that we're using our resources in the best possible way. So as your Chief of Defence Staff, it's my responsibility to establish a direction for the military. The four priorities that are key for the Canadian Armed Forces as I see them are the following. First, delivering excellence in operations. Second, preparing the Canadian Armed Forces for the challenges of tomorrow. Third, leading the profession of arms. And finally, caring for our members and for their families. And I'd like to come back to each of those in turn briefly, if I could. But together, these priorities serve as a guide to drive consistency and bring us together with a sense of purpose through the whole change of command, from the Admiral right down through to the Corporal. And I've shared them with everybody I've met along the way and the leadership of defence, civilian and military. And this evening, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to discuss them with you. Let's talk first a little bit more about delivering excellence in operations. Really, this priority sits alone at the very top. If Canadians can't depend on their military to deliver this excellence when it matters, when Canadians and their interests require defence, then really none of the rest of my priorities matter that much. The outpouring of compassion that we see from Canadians for our military members who suffer from me mental health issues right now, I predict would quickly dry up if they felt they could no longer depend on their military. I'd like to think I'm wrong in this point, but it doesn't matter. We're not going to take that risk. Excellence in operations also means doing our fair share internationally with our allies to, to promote peace peace and stability. Our mission in Afghanistan in many ways defined the Canadian Armed Forces over the past decade. It brought a natural focus to what we did and it was a forcing function for excellence. As you know, we've operated in that country for more than 12 years now. More than 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members have served in Afghanistan and many have served more than once. With our NATO allies and partners, the Canadian Armed Forces have helped Afghans reclaim their country from terrorism and provide security for the Afghan population. It clears the path to hope and opportunity. Canadians also contributed to the construction of more than 24,000 kilometres of roads, 75 kilometres of railways, and all of this works to enhance commerce and communications. And working with our international partners, we also helped connect Afghan communities to the nat national electric grid while helping increase education opportunities with more than 13,000 new schools. In the last few years, the Canadian Armed Forces have played an integral part in assisting Afghans take control of the ownership of their security so that they would acquire the expertise needed to help them protect their own communities and preser preserve their hard-won freedoms. Today, Afghan security forces comprise more than 340,000 police and military. They're robust, they're surprisingly professional, they're well-trained, and they're operationally proven. So the redeployment of international troops, including Canadian Armed Forces, is a logical progression directly linked to the growth in the quality and quantity of the Afghan National Security Forces. I should note that although the Canadian Armed Forces is redeploying this year, last of our forces out at the end of uh, March, Canada remains committed to Afghanistan beyond 2014 with financial support to assist in the sustainment of the Afghan National Security Forces and diplomatically through our embassy. I'll be over there on March the 12th taking the Canadian flag down at the military base where our operations have been centred and handing it over to our head of mission so she can be the face of Canada as Afghans write the next chapters of their story. As I mentioned earlier, Canada's are Canadians are relying on the Canadian Armed Forces to keep them safe. So we, the military, have to be ready to answer the call wherever the situation is and wherever it's taking place in our vast country. To maintain our readiness, we conduct different exercises and operations at home, such as Operation Nanook, which is the premier Canadian Armed Forces annual operation in the north, contributing to the government's commitment to exercise Canadian sovereignty in the northern region. The hallmark of this operation is the outstanding whole of government cooperation between the military personnel we send and a wide variety of other groups, federal, 
territorial and municipal departments and agencies. For example, as part of Operation Anuk 2013, held last August, we conducted an exercise in Whitehorse where the Canadian Armed Forces supported territorial and municipal authorities in the context of a wildfire that was taking place or was exercised to take place in and around Nunavut. Next, we ran scenarios involving military assistment to assistance to law enforcement agencies elsewhere in Nunavut. Nunavut. And every time we run such an exercise, we gather and leave behind a plethora of lessons when we leverage, which we leverage in the next operation or actual emergency in the north. And the Arctic is a tough place for most of the year. You know, there's an army saying that if we can successfully deploy to our own Arctic, we can successfully deploy anywhere in the world. Well, I guess as long as they're not shooting at us elsewhere. Which brings me to my second priority. That is preparing the Canadian Armed Forces for tomorrow. How do we ensure that the Canadian Armed Forces are ready for the challenges we think are most likely to face us as a nation in the future? Well, we simply have to invest in our military's capabilities from equipment to infrastructure to training and we have to devote resources to research and innovation. Now after a decade of intense operational tempo due to our multiple missions, including our work in Afghanistan, and thanks to the Government of Canada's very real investments in the military over the past decade, the Canadian Armed Forces are amongst the most agile and professional forces capable of opera uh, operating in a wide range of operations with our domestic partners here at home, or with our international allies abroad. I speak proudly of that, but you just have to go to international articles written by our allies to see the kind of partner that we have provided to the alliances. I believe the Canadian Armed Forces are well positioned to meet today's challenge. However, I have to make sure through proper stewardship, government investments in the military, that your investments and my people are protected. And I also have to ensure that we're able to maintain this level of readiness tomorrow and for the years to come. So one way that we, the defense team, decided to do that is through the defense renewal process. Resource stewardship is a big part of what defense renewals about. Now, last year, the Minister of National Defense asked the Deputy Minister of Defense and I to review the way we do business, to look for efficiencies and to apply them through the department. For a lot of you here engaged in commercial ventures, this would be a standard thing to do. For defense, it's really innovative thinking. It's hard to define our business processes as business processes. So we're looking now at how we manage a wide range of areas such as maintenance, property, information technology or IT systems and our personnel. And let me give you some examples here. We're rationalizing our IT service desks across the country from 120 locations to less than 20. Many of you would say, yep, good idea, something we've done recently. We're also centralizing real property management under a single authority right now spread amongst 12 and we're conducting video-based career interviews which break a culture that for decades has required travel between Ottawa and each of our bases. These are simple changes, but with a de de department as large as defense, everything we do more efficiently ends up contributing to more training and operational effect. And improving the way we do business will generate considerable savings, savings we can reinvest to build an even more capable and agile Canadian Armed Forces. This is a smart thing to do, to ensure that we have enough resources down the road to maintain our equipment, to keep our current infrastructure in good shape, to have our men and women in uniform well trained, and be, to be able to invest in research and innovation. Uh, in this way, we'll continue to build a flexible and efficient military for years to come. An important part in preparing our military for the future is defense procurement. You hear a little bit about that in the news these days. Our men and women in uniform need specialized and often very expensive gear. The new defense procurement strategy is challenging us to improve how we conduct business and how we streamline the business of procurement. 
Defence procurement certainly had great success in the last few years, but we've also had to do some work to ensure that our processes are as efficient as they can be. This new defence procurement strategy incorporates a new challenge function within national defence that will support the early review of projects and resource allocation. And I'm fond of pointing out that if an early challenge function is met satisfactorily, then you actually have an early endorsement function of the requirements stated by the Canadian Armed Forces. And that will be very helpful to accelerating them through other processes. This early challenge function will include third-party reviews of high-level mandatory retirements, what we bring forward for the equipment, the capabilities we think Canadians will need for their defence in the future, for all projects valued above $100 million and for other select projects below this value. And an internal review panel will provide recommendations to the Deputy Minister of National Defence, bringing together the necessary expertise from military, scientific and policy communities, and then to coordinate third-party reviews. And to streamline the procurement process and improve its efficiency, the government will also increase our authority to acquire goods and services below the mark that we've just talked about. So thanks to the defence renewal process and the new defence procurement strategy, we are ensuring that our men and women in uniform will have the tools they need to do their job today and to face tomorrow's operational challenges. My third priority is leading the profession of arms. This truly speaks to the fabric and the strength of the military. Frankly, we have to ensure that our men and women in uniform receive the training they need to do their job. And that's why leading the profession of arms is such a priority. It's a complex world out there, and we need highly trained leaders. We've seen time and again how our soldiers, really strategic corporals in certain situations, could turn the course of diplomatic relations simply by making a bad decision. And the types of decisions we ask our personnel to make in the field and the range of skills that are demanded of them require that they continuously adapt and learn. So it's crucial that our men and women in uniform maintain the highest standard through first-rate education, first-rate training and professional development. A crucial part of this training is done, for, for instance, for colonels and naval captains through the National Security Program at the Canadian Forces College. Through this course, senior officers deepen their knowledge of defence and security issues at home and abroad, and several people in here speak to them during the course of that syllabus. They study security strategies, terrorism trends, international relations, and much more. And they work alongside students from other nations and other government departments. As a result, this course prepares our military leaders to provide a wide variety of tasks from responding to natural disasters at home to stabilizing conflict situations abroad. And this is just one example of the multiple courses, programs and other training opportunities offered to our military members. In fact, by the time a military member retires after a full 35 year career, he or she will likely have spent about a third of their time in uniform undergoing direct training or enrolled in professional military education. Our culture is that we have books open on the dining room table permanently. This brings me to the last of the priorities I'll speak about tonight, and that is caring for our members and for their families. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned earlier, the Canadian Armed Forces need the very best and the brightest because we depend on our people to face these extraordinary challenges you've heard about and to be extraordinary when this happens. The profession of arms is a demanding one. It can mean putting service to country before oneself and one's family. And it can, be, it can mean accepting very real risks. It means being ready to deploy on very short notice and often at a very short moment's notice to help our fellow Canadians here at home or to support those in need overseas. The Canadian Armed Forces dedicate their lives and their professional careers in service to this country and it's our responsibility to take good care of them and of their families. And that's why the Department of National Defence has many initiatives in place to support our men and women in uniform and we've gotten much better at it through our time in Afghanistan. For example, we provide our military members with robust pre- and post-deployment mental health programs in order to ensure that they're well equipped for the stresses and risks and potentially trauma with which they will be faced during their deployment. 
Now this program includes mental health screening as part of the pre-deployment medical assessment and pre-deployment psychosocial screening by either a chaplain or mental health professionals or a group of each. Every Canadian Armed Forces member today who is preparing to deploy also receives the Road to Mental Readiness training program. And this program combines classroom and interactive learning and helps participants understand and prepare as much as they can in a classroom for the impact of deployment on mental health. The course prepares our troops for the physiological reactions to stress and how to mitigate those reactions. It teaches the importance and application of goal setting, of visualization, of self-talk and stress management, and it reviews the challenges that may be encountered while deployed and their potential impact. It describes the roles of leaders during deployment in helping manage soldiers' stress in their subordinates and it identifies stressful factors that may impact the family of a member while deployed. And for the last part of this program, family members are provided, they're brought in and provided the, a portion of these briefings in order to help manage their stresses, the stresses associated with a loved one being over in combat. Once their assignment overseas is completed, and I should say, during that assignment, if soldiers come across something which challenges them, an IED, a traumatic situation of any kind, our men and women in uniform are quickly stress debriefed by mental health workers. And once their assignment overseas is completed, our men and women in uniform go through a five-day third location decompression program, something we learned. A whole lot better than bringing a warrior home one day and having him reintegrated with his family where his spouse or her spouse has been in charge of that family and not all that appreciative of these very rapid changes in inputs. In this program each returning soldier is, is encouraged to speak to uh, mental health professionals and to raise any concerns they feel may be developing. So ladies and gentlemen, today I wanted to give you a better idea of where the Canadian Armed Forces are right now and where we want to be in the next few years. But I also wanted to mention the importance of this country's support to our men and women in uniform. I was at the Lady, Our Lady of Lourdes High School today in Guelph a little bit earlier and I had the pleasure to, to talk with uh, to young Canadians, future leaders about the leadership and pride in the Canadian Armed Forces. And I was proud to tell them that Canada has one of the most professional military militaries in the world. Uh, but it wasn't always the case that Canadians wrapped their arms around the military and the veterans who were there today remember not so long ago when they did not feel that love. In my own career, there were times when Canadians were in fact quite oblivious to what Canadians were doing for them overseas. But their enthusiasm at the school and their interest in the Canadian Armed Forces leads me not only to believe that they are taking up the challenges that will face them, but they also know about the excellent work of our men and women in uniform. And in communities all across the country, we see this and appreciate it. This genuine support that we get from Canadians every day is invaluable and is greatly appreciated. So I'd like to thank you all for taking interest in your Canadian Armed Forces this evening. I hope you continue to do so in the months and years to come. And I'm delighted to be here with you and hope to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Tom, uh, for your presentation on the uh, state of the armed forces and its priorities. We will be opening it up now to uh, question and answers. Uh, so if you're here in the auditorium and you'd like to ask Tom a question, please uh, proceed to the microphones at the front where the volunteers are there. We do ask you to state your name, just so we know, uh, so you can introduce yourself, and also to please keep your uh, questions brief if you could. Uh, Tom has uh, just 15 or 20 minutes. He's got to catch a, a plane back to Ottawa. Uh, are you flying the plane? 
Uh, well, uh, as soon as you offered me a uh, small glass of Pinot Grigio, that decision was made. I'm not flying the plane. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tom has very generously, as he mentioned, given his time to this entire region today, as he mentioned being at that high school in Guelph, meeting with the high school students, accepting a leadership award. He also met today with uh, CG's researchers in an in a informal workshop we had to discuss global and security uh, policy issues around the world today. So it's, it's been a, a great day and very generous uh, giving of your time. Um, just before we start at the microphone, I'd like to ask one question. I feel obliged actually to check in on something I should have uh, checked in on years ago. It's a promise I made to you. I uh, sort of harp on the distant past, uh, but um, it's something you actually, I promise you extracted. Uh, cast your mind back to 1975, if you will, and we're skinny 17 year olds in Etobicoke and uh, long hair down to our shoulders, if you can imagine, folks. And uh, you know, you were a cool guy. You played the guitar, and uh, girls thought you looked like Donny Osmond, and played football. And uh, so, but then you astonished your buddies by announcing that you were going to Royal Military College, getting the haircut, wearing the uniform, and uh, you said you were going for the great education and a chance to be a pilot. Uh, but you made us promise that if you ever fell in love with brass buttons and polished boots, that we'd come and get you out of there. So I feel obliged to uh, check in on that promise and ask you, how's the whole military thing working out for you? <laughs> well, thanks for that, Fred, and uh, you have an unbelievable memory. Uh, in fact, I remember that very same thing. I, I, I was really kind of joining the military for a year to try it out and then join you guys back at, uh, uh, back at home. Um, but I think what, what anybody finds when they join the military is very quickly, it's not about the brass buttons and polished boots, it's about uh, camaraderie and leadership and challenge, and those things grow on you. And, uh, you know, when you see uh, the, the, that you will have an opportunity not only to do very exciting things, uh, I see one of my old fighter uh, instructors right here, uh, up in the front row, uh, our sailors love sailing, our uh, our uh, soldiers love driving tanks and, and firing off artillery pieces. And then it grows even further. You know, you, you actually start to move on to the moral high ground of all of those things that are uh, associated with uh, uh, protecting Canadians and defending Canadian interests. So uh, it, it's, it's quick uh, upon one's inauguration into the military that you see that the military is so much more than than polished shoes and brass buttons, so I, I, don't come and rescue me. Okay, fine, you're fine, good to know. Uh, you do enough work uh, rescuing other Canadians, I know. Um, let's turn to the microphones and start over here. And I recognize actually Dave Paolini, who was our student council president in Kipling and is now the head of public relations and communications at Christie Digital here in Waterloo. Hello, David. Oh, uh, thanks, Fred. Hey, Dave. Um, Tom, coming over here, uh, I was talking with a cab driver. He was very big on the uh, Chinese military buildup, and uh, asked me to ask you what your opinion is of Canada's Pacific-facing military. Um, do we have an interest in the East as well as the West? Yeah, thanks for that, Dave. And, and the answer is, of course, absolutely we do. Um, as the Chief of Defence Staff, uh, one of uh, my greatest assets is the uh, uh, Chief of Defence Intelligence, uh, and he's part of quite a security and intelligence network uh, spread across the country. So they're keeping an eye uh, all across uh, the world for hotspots and uh, developing state uh, actors. Uh, and, and China's far more than a developing state actor. Um, their budget uh, in defense has risen extremely quickly. It's uh, still nowhere near uh, what the Americans put in defense, uh, but it has caught their interest as well as ours. I will say uh, that it's interesting. Um, that our government has signaled that relationships and, and commerce and trade with China is a priority uh, and uh, so all diplomatic tools including defense are used to support that uh, and, and uh, so the Chinese have made full use of these opportunities and request very frequently to come to Canada uh, to study how we carry out logistical support for instance, uh, language training, uh, the Royal Military College is, is often uh, uh, targeted for high level visits uh, uh, from the uh, Chinese military. Uh, it's a very friendly relationship, very friendly and open uh, to a certain point. 
uh, and, and beyond that, uh, we're all interested because, of course, uh, there are other things that we're very interested in, and that is perhaps a Chinese military role uh, in uh, cyber and, uh, and exactly how that could affect us. So uh, we, uh, uh, we trust our, our growing friendship and verify. Thank you. Why don't we go to this microphone here? Good evening, General. I'm a graduate student here at University of Waterloo in history. And my question is, um, with the winding down of the Afghan mission, as well as the new set of other challenges that are coming up, what are the implications of these challenges for the Army, especially its combat arms, as well as the expectations for its new generation of leaders? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it speaks to the fact uh, that Afghanistan, uh, not just for the Army, but for the Air Force, and to a certain extent, uh, the operations around Afghanistan for our Navy, have forced us to be extremely serious about what we do. We were losing troops uh, in action. Um, so I think what we can do for a certain period of time uh, is spend what we need to spend to determine what lessons can be drawn from Afghanistan and generalized to other threats that we think we may face in coming years. Uh, the great news is right now we could not be more standardized and interoperational with our allies. We have young non-commissioned officers and officers who have an entire career spent in Afghanistan in combat and we can use that uh, in training to continue to bolster our readiness. That will decrease over time. Um, of course, it's going to have to be allowed to decrease over time um, only if we don't, aren't engaged again in another challenge or combat area in the future. Um, I would finish up by saying that as Chief of Defence Staff, uh, I hope to have another year and a half in this position and I would be delighted to retire as a peacetime Chief of Defence Staff. But that's not what I'm counting on. I'm planning in every way on being ready uh, to not be that. In other words, uh, all of our forces will be entirely ready uh, for when the government requires options for us in uh, not only humanitarian assistance, but all the way uh, to combat operations should that be required. Thank you. Thank you, General. Let's take the next uh, question at that microphone, please. Good evening, General. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. I'm Jesse McLean. I'm a grad student here. You've spoken about the work Canada's forces do in terms of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. With that in mind, I'd like to ask you for a comment about the future of the Disaster Assistance Response Team, the DART, one of Canada's most best humanitarian amb ambassadors abroad. What future do you see for them under your priorities for the Canadian forces? Yeah. What a fantastic uh, opportunity for our DART to, uh, to show off what they can do. You know, in the worst situation, uh, Typhoon Haiyan hit just before Christmas in Philippines, uh, displacing so many hundreds of thousands uh, of uh, Filipinos. Uh, and we were on the ground as a result of the C-17 and a very ready disaster and, uh, ready, uh, and uh, uh, disaster assistance relief team. Uh, and all of their equipment was in within days. You know, we're, we're close to first on the ground amongst our allies uh, and yet half a world away. Really remarkable. In for about six weeks and then out when the non-governmental organizations came in to take over uh, the, the clearance. Along the way there, uh, providing fresh water to those in need, clearing roads, getting electrical systems back up and providing a hospital to those who had suffered uh, damages. Uh, I think what we see is to, to, to make that team more and more responsive in smaller, smaller packages. Packages. Uh, you'll remember uh, when um, uh, the tsunami hit in Southeast Asia, uh, the disaster assistance response team took about two or three weeks to get into place, and part of that was because we didn't yet have C-17s, which we now have, but also because we took everything across. That's what we trained for. Now we've become modularized, become more and more agile and responsive, depending on the requirement uh, and the humanitarian uh, disaster. So I think that's where we'll see it. We'll, we'll continue to, uh, to train people up to very high standards in engineering, uh, in healthcare, uh, in, uh, in water purification, and electronics and refrigeration, all of these things, but seek 
to be able to uh, deploy them in as small teams as can be uh, responsive. Thank you, General. Thank you. I'd like to take a question from our web audience, and it's actually something that you addressed in your remarks uh, regarding mental health in the armed forces, preparing people. Uh, but a question from our, uh, one of our web viewers asks you to expand on that, so if I could just read this. In December, you released a statement on the recent soldier suicides in Canada. Can you expand on the initiatives that the armed forces is undertaking to support soldiers suffering from PTSD? That's from Marion and Barry, and, and maybe I could just add to that. If, if you could talk about, there were some news stories about the delay in the hiring of the additional personnel that that $11.5 million was provided for. Mm -hmm. um, what, what have been the challenges here and, and what is going on right now? Well, um, first of all, it, it's a great question. I really appreciate uh, that that question really represents how Canadians are feeling about their, their military. You know, this is a, a, a really perplexing problem. Um, while I would have agreed, um, uh, as would every Chief of Defence staff, that we have uh, a, a, a mental health challenge that outstrips uh, Canadian society, and, and that's understandable. That's kind of the cost. We talked about it a little bit. It's the, co it's the cost of putting people into traumatic situations. Uh, we have put in place, especially over the last 10 years, tremendous facilities to deal with that. Operational trauma and stress clinics, uh, 24 integrated personnel support units, uh, a really responsive leadership team that will bring people in, and if it's just a problem sleeping, uh, then we can quickly get people sweet sleeping again. You know, 91% of people in uniform will complete their careers never having had anything uh, medical of note uh, to lead to any problems. Uh, that leaves about 9%, and a portion of them uh, will have bruised knees from uh, jumps, bad backs from carrying rucksacks. Uh, but a certain portion will come back from operations and require mental health services. And I was delighted coming on as Canadian Forces uh, Chief of Defence Staff to see the depth of what we've got. It outstrips anything uh, that we would have as civilians in Canadian society. Uh, just to give you a bit of an idea, if a soldier puts up his or her hand on any given day and says they're having difficulty processing things that, uh, that they uh, had to deal with a year ago, five years ago, even ten years ago, likely before the end of the day they will see a mental health worker. Uh, after that, if it can be uh, dealt with very quickly, we can get them back in uniform. If it's not, if it's something more than that, then it's all about the soldier and that soldier's family. We put the career on hold, bring the person out of uniform, and then help them put in a program, help them work uh, with that program, and it could take months, it could take years. We find that we have about a third of those who are truly suffering from post-traumatic stress return to uniform fine, set to go. Another third the trigger is the uniform. Once they're out of the uniform, then we, we don't really have a set specific time. We can take years again to help them transition into a new, uh, a new profession. And again, Canadian companies are lining up to help us with that. A hundred Canadian companies have signed up with Canada Company uh, to, to have a first grab at these individuals. Then about another third will suffer ongoing symptoms with post-traumatic stress. So it's not, a, it's not a simple thing. We're getting better at it, uh, but this research is going on with our allies all around the world. Of course, post-traumatic post stress used to be known as shell shock in the First World War. It's not new. So I'm, I'm actually quite pleased with how we're meeting, how we're lowering the stigma uh, to have soldiers, sailors, airmen, and airwomen come forward and seek help. But the connection to suicides is less direct. Previous to this year, for the last couple of decades, Canada has had between 11 and 15 suicides amongst our 100,000 in regular force uniforms uh, and reserve force uniforms. Now, there is cold comfort in any uh, set of um, statistics regarding suicide. One suicide rips apart entire families and units, and in our business where camaraderie and leadership is such a fundamental part of what we do, we all feel like losers, even with one. But what our health workers say, a little less sanguine, a little more sanguine about this, is that our suicide rates were lower than the same age groups and genders in Canadian society. What comfort could be taken was taken there. 
What we've seen recently is a cluster of suicides. It's very troubling. A cluster before Christmas that brought our numbers. In fact, we were on a record low number as we approached Christmas for the, the uh, year. That cluster of suicides that you may have heard about brought us up to 13, which is our, our average over the last couple of decades. But they've continued in a very troubling way. Uh, and our experts are, are uh, very concerned about the fact that in a way, as Canadians and as leaders, we've put our arms around uh, those who are suffering from mental health, that we may have even brought a slight honor to the act of suicide. You know, while we try and destigmatize putting your hand up for mental health assistance, actually stigmatizing the act of suicide is probably a very good thing in our society. It's not a good way off this planet. Uh, so we're very concerned about, as we rally around our troops, uh, what we may be doing to this, uh, to, to this impression of, of suicide. It, it has our great attention, uh, and until recently, we wouldn't have said the two were directly linked. Good, thanks for that. All right, let's take another question from the microphone here. Hello, General Lawson. My name is Derek Ovi. I'm a college student currently taking a year off to save up some money to go back and a future hopeful of the Canadian Armed Forces. I was wondering, with the large amount of resources used, both monetary and physical, in Afghanistan and the concurrent operations, is there a particular timeline on when Canada will be fully, oper one, fully and 100% operational, not just with our excellent men and women, but with that monetary and physical thing, such as tanks, etc.? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, just to re rephrase the question a little bit, your question is regarding the, the uh, um, resourcing? Yes, with, with the high amount of resources, not just the physical, but the monetary as well, um, I was under the impression that our men and women are ready to deploy, but our equipment due to repairs and the money it takes to deploy, we're not at a 100% peak of operational readiness, we're only at a certain percentage. Um, well, there, there's a certain truth to that. While we were in Afghanistan, uh, we uh, had a certain uh, surplus of readiness back in Canada that was available for another small deployment. For instance, to Haiti. Uh, we were in Haiti helping out with the, uh, um, with the earthquake that happened there while we were in Afghanistan. Uh, and when they came back, shortly after that, we were in Libya, as you'll recall. Uh, where we've and where we've come to now, we're down to a, we were, we've been a thousand people in Afghanistan for the last two years, down from 3,000. That allowed time for the army to reconstitute itself and declare itself ready for another mission as large, if required by Can the Canadian government, uh, as, as large as Afghanistan. So uh, it's true we've had the time to be able to rebuild. Uh, you're right as well that the equipment got very tired from being over in Afghanistan. Uh, and that was quite an effort to bring it back up, but the light armored vehicles, uh, the tanks, uh, the helicopters that we used over there have all been reconstituted. We're pretty good at getting ready again. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, General. <laughs> all right, the next question here, please. Go ahead. Good evening, sir. I am Nathan Glass, a cadet at the Royal Canadian at the 121 Red Arrows Air Cadet Squadron. In oh, very good. And I've got a question coming from a lot of my fellow cadets and from myself, especially specifically budget wise. Where is the cadet program headed? Well, actually, then you probably would have had your eye on the budget a couple of days ago. Yes, and uh, and I'd likely would have been uh, fairly delighted uh, to see uh, that there are no stated cuts to the military. Uh, what you would have seen is that uh, some of the money that has been uh, earmarked for the purchase of different fleets and pieces of equipment is pushed down lane a little way. Uh, so you would be right to think that we are now working on a budget that is less than it was uh, in the peak years of Afghanistan, uh, but I think that puts us in the same ballpark as 27 of our tw 28 uh, allies in uh, NATO. Uh, so that's why we, we have to learn uh, to provide as much readiness as we can for a slightly uh, reduced uh, resource envelope. But if I could just ask, were you asking specifically about the budget for the cadets? Or 
Pardon? Were you asking specifically about funding for cadets? Yes, sir. Ah, very good. Thank you for keeping me online. Uh, cadets are very important. Uh, 35,000 uh, uh, cadets uh, across uh, Canada. Uh, and uh, when I went to the Royal Military College, fully a third of everyone there uh, had come through Cadets Canada, uh, like yourself. Uh, that is a robust uh, um, unit and set of organizations and will remain so. We, uh, we rely on, uh, on the tremendous influx of uh, cadets who then consider uh, the military as a, as a career. Uh, you may have heard that uh, towards the end of last year's budgeting season, uh, we uh, cut some of the money to uniforms, uh, feeling that this was probably a fair, balanced uh, cut. Uh, in fact, what we had not planned on is that uh, uh, when we cut from about 100% back to 90%, uh, the cadets had already spent 90% of their entire clothing budget, which meant there was no money left uh, for the last uh, couple of months of the season. Uh, we've looked after that and uh, I'm sure we've got uh, uh, uniforms for the last few cadets uh, joining uh, and April 1st is uh, right around uh, the, the uh, corner. Uh, we'll have an entire new budget for the cadets. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question and I see there's someone at the mic here. Why don't we take this one? Thank you. Uh, good evening, General Lawson. I'm a first year PhD student here. Uh, my name is Rapendra Mongit. And um, I'm hoping to focus my dissertation on uh, uh, civil military relations. Um, and uh, so having you here is an exceptional treat. Um, what my question is, is how are the Canadian forces engaging with uh, publics uh, through the use of social media? Is there a uh, any plan to use social media to engage more with Canadians, if at all? Well, very good. So I, I think you, uh, uh, you might even be making a suggestion there if we're not. Um, we have very few policies that drive us into social uh, media at this point. Uh, what we do see, however, is that uh, uh, some of our leaders are uh, developing Facebook pages, uh, others are tweeting regularly. Uh, recently there was a Bell Let's Talk Day in which everybody was focused on trying to bring the stigma down on uh, putting your hand up when you need mental health. Uh, during that day, the head of the Royal Canadian Navy, uh, Admiral uh, Mark Norman, uh, put his hand up uh, and tweeted uh, that he twice had made use of mental health facilities and it hadn't held his career up too badly. The Canadian Forces Chief Warrant Officer, Chief Warrant Officer Kevin West, used it uh, very effectively in the same way. So I, I think that what we see is ourselves is on the edge of that uh, and, uh, and probably just starting to tap into something uh, that our newer generations as they come up will help, help us to do quite naturally as they become leaders within the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just a few end notes. First, I'd like to thank you, uh, Tom, for coming here today, uh, for giving your time to the whole region in Guelph and, uh, and spending time with our researchers today and uh, having a frank discussion there. And then also speaking here tonight to uh, the audience in Waterloo, to the Canadian public, really, through our webcast. Uh, thank you very much for your marks, for your frankness in dealing with some of the tough questions. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your time and your leadership. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fred, and thank you to all. Thank you. Second. I'd just like to add a, a few end notes uh, before we adjourn. I'd just like to mention that the video of tonight's webcast will be posted to the CG website so you can share it with people there. And our next public events in the CG Auditorium on Monday, March 3rd, we continue our CG Cinema Series with a screening of Inside Job. This film narrated by Matt Damon won the 2010 Academy Award for Best Documentary. It reveals how systemic corruption helped fuel the financial crisis of 2008. And then on Wednesday, March 5th, we welcome you U.S. venture capitalist and economist Bill Janeway, who explains what he learned by doing capitalism and investing in innovation, including in the technology sector. And on Tuesday, March 18th, we feature Omar Samad, a senior Central Asia fellow at the New America Foundation and an expert in residence with the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington. He's going to talk about the future of Afghanistan after the Canadian, American, and British militaries pull out later this year. So be sure to register for all of these events in our events newsletter and and information all, on all of our upcoming lectures. Thank you for, for coming to CG tonight. Have a safe journey home.
Thanks, Thanks so much. Much.